Hi, good evening. On behalf of the museum, I'd like to welcome you all for coming here today. It's, it's a small, intimate group, but I'm hoping we have some good discussions after. Uh, today we have with us Mayank Mansing Call. And I just want to say that Mayank is, Mayank is a writer and a curator, and I think he's one of the few people who's been very consistently working on textile and textile design histories. He uh, studied um, textile design at NID. He's curated many shows, he's written, he's also been associated with the museum, he's helped us research our textile collection. Most recently, he was the curator for the big exhibition that happened at Jawahar Kala Kendra in Jaipur on textile. He also curated Ritu Kumar's collection recently. And now, without further delay, I'm going to give it over to Maya, who's going to present to us. Thank you so much, Maya. Thank you, Pooja. I'm always very happy to be here, and thanks for having me. Um, before we begin, because I've had a few responses on this already, and since it's a small group, I thought it may be nice to um, just get quick perspectives from some of you on when you think of the title, Modern, what is it that um, first comes to your mind? Um, or do you have some kind of an idea about you know, its association professionally or personally with you. Because it's a, it's a heavily used word, uh, and for those of us who work in the arts and design, of course, it comes with a lot of technical connotations and histories. And I thought it'd be nice because there's always a very diverse group um, as an audience to try and understand how are you sort of thinking about this uh, in your own life, and, and sort of that might help me sort of get a cue to start. Just a few random, yeah, please. For example, I am an architecture student. Right. So, uh, for us, there is a particular modernism uh, era. It belongs to a timeline. So, that is modern and modern is a very Few more, maybe three or four more, and then. Like uh, I'm an artist. For me, if I use any craft or any traditional form, I would uh, kind of break it from just tradition and uh, so make it a little modernize or in my own perspective to it. So similarly, I think uh, as designers, when they uh, use crafts in the traditional forms, they add their own element. So that is in this context, I think, many models. So it's sort of craft versus modern, or modern uh, uh, suggests? Okay. Not versus, but I think how you merge together. Okay. Okay. Breaking away from tradition. Breaking away from tradition, okay. So it's minimalism versus, uh, or as distinct from decorative or ornamental. Okay, so great, thank you for that. Um, I'm actually in town at the Bhadra Jilad Museum over the weekend because I'm, I'm conducting a module uh, for the art history program that they have um, on contemporary expressions in traditional practices and tradi or traditional expressions in contemporary practices. And we spent the last two days discussing a lot about um, the implications and definitions of the word tradition, modern, uh, and contemporary. And now I'm doing this thing on the modern because um, I went to design school and also um, uh, uh, the associations and the, and the kind of education and, and curriculum that we sort of went to received, made us receive um, modernism as a kind of um, West-centric, phenomena that comes to India at a certain point in the mid 20th century um, and it has aesthetically its associations with a kind of minimalism um, geometry that helps the world uh, at that time uh, depart from a history of 
that kind of um, decorative, ornamental uh, mode of producing um, art and design and so on and so forth. Um, and therefore I thought it might be interesting to kind of situate this in the Indian context to begin with this because this is a handloom sari, it's a kanjivaram. Um, and for most of us something like this um, as you know, as much as it evokes a kind of geometrical, abstract kind of aesthetic, uh, still firmly kind of situates itself um, in a kind of traditional um, uh, kind of ethos of handloom and handmade textiles in India of craft and so on and so forth. Uh, but what I'm interested in is that actually, so I mean, this is the kind of associations today we have of the Kanjivaram, right? It's, 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 it's associated with a certain kind of opulence. Um, this is how when you do a quick Google search on, uh, you know, on Kanjivaram, these are the kind of associations that, you know, come up with or this, uh, you know, a couple of years back, a highly figurative, decorative um, Kanjivaram sari with portraits from a Raja, Raja Ravi Varma painting slated to be opposed as or claimed as uh, the most expensive Kanjivaram made um, in the world. So um, there are these kinds of associations that traditional Indian crafts and textiles have always carried with them. Um, and then to try and see the, this kind of an aesthetic within the Kanjivaram was something that I constantly kind of asked myself uh, about. Um, and um, it's quite interesting because the Kanjivaram sari itself went through a kind of renaissance of its own sorts and that was in the 50s. Um, and this was post the national movement um, when uh, a person called Rukmini Arundale um, started something called Kalakshetra in, in Madras, now Chennai. Um, and it came from um, an earlier kind of tradition of uh, theosophy or the theosophical movement um, at its time very very current and something that was very much part of the national movement about how do you understand religions, the commonness of, of religions and trying to kind of understand the philosophy behind religions at a time where you know religious communal, communalism and, and, and religious identities were being played out a lot through the national movement towards the end. So the theosophical movement comes at a time um, well, it's trying to look at the essence of what is common in all of the religions. Um, and a lot of Kalakshetra's early impetus and a lot of its early ideas are actually formed by the Theosophical movement. Uh, and at that point, um, uh, the entire movement kind of started rejecting um, uh, uh, aspects of Indian culture that they felt this was a liberal uh, kind of brand of politics uh, Nehruvian in the north um, that was trying to usher a kind of new cultural era for the country where you could forget about the past and the kind of uh, cultural baggage um, that India had carried for centuries. So as you might know the national movement was um, full of you know, reform movements, whether they were religious or social and so on and so forth. And so it was actually in this kind of a context that the Theosophical movement inspired the Kalakshetra experiment. And through that, a kind of modernization of the Bharatnatyam dance, which until then had been associated with the tradition of the Devdasis. So it was this movement that actually rejected the tradition of the Devdasi as something that was socially regressive and so on and so forth. And it was in this kind of revival of what Bharatnatyam meant for the 20th century in the 50s that also um, a new identity for the Kanjivaram Sari was invented. And the loaded, excessive, um, ornamental, decorative aspects of this handloom tradition was much like the kind of other aspects of, of, of Bharatnatyam and other cultural um, sort of phenomena at that time associated with religion, sort of rejected towards what we can see um, a kind of universal aesthetic. I mean, in its color, this particular sari, which is a re recent reproduction of Arundali, uh, Arukmini Arundali's experiments with the Kalakshetra sari. So the color is rooted in a certain kind of Indian context, but you can see that there is an overall allude to um, a kind of minimalism, to a kind of geometrical abstract abstractionism. And often we don't def we don't look at these occurrences in India in the early to mid 20th century because we are so loaded uh, with our associations with 
um, with architecture and modernism. But here I'm presenting you an idea of a, a handloom experiment which comes out of a revival of a traditional dance movement and tradition, uh, which itself um, could in many ways, so I mean in, in, in later years you might have heard of um, contemporary dancers taking on this idea of Rukmini Arundali, but taking it to another level. So I'm showing you this image much later of the work of Chandra Lekha, who was a dancer um, uh, based out of Madras and who then takes this idea of the Kanjivaram Sari uh, and further kind of minimalizes it and further makes it more abstract to suit a contemporary or modern, whichever way you look at it, uh, format for the Bharatnatyam, which is very, very starkly geometrical and actually in many ways exaggerates um, the kind of rigor um, and the movement that Bharatnatyam itself has. So it exaggerates that geometrical aspect of the presentation, uh, which otherwise was softened usually and, and kind of makes it even more sharper. Uh, and, and in that, the sari, right up till the 80, the Kanjivaram sari uh, became a very important instrument to aid that kind of a, a visuality and that kind of um, evocation of geometrical abstractionism. Uh, so another image from Chandralekha's dance repertoire where you can see even the way the, uh, the, the, the dance movements or the productions or presentations were photographed had that kind of idea um, that you can see or reflect it, uh, perhaps much in, a, in the same way that when you look uh, as, as the architecture that we associate. So I'm trying to create this kind of a, um, similarity because um, like the gentleman said, I think for most of us this idea of modernism is so restricted and limited in, in India to the mid-century and 20th century and its experiments of, of bringing in Western ideas of architecture in, in, in modernism that were very current for its time all over the world. And often because our discourse and our associations of that kind of modernism uh, remain so um, synonymous with this, this is Chandigarh, it's Loko Bhusia who designed Chandigarh, the city, the new capital for um, Chandigarh and uh, for, for Punjab and Haryana both. Um, and um, I'm trying to, in this presentation, um, try and share with you a few other occurrences like the Kalakshetra experiment of the Sari, um, uh, where mostly in the realm of product design, interiors and architecture, of course, uh, which can help us understand uh, what were the other ways in which modernism was, was being expressed in the country? What were the other ways in, in which international modernism was coming into the country? How India was responding to them? Um, and I, I think with that it can sort of help us um, uh, rethink um, our kind of modernist beginnings in a kind of new way. Um, Chandigarh uh, Corbusier was, had been commissioned by um, a mill owner, owning, owning family in Gujarat, the Sarabhais, um, often referred to as, as among the greatest commissioners of art and architecture in the country. Um, in Ahmedabad, uh, to build two homes, he eventually built four buildings in Ahmedabad. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about that later. At some point, Chandigarh was commissioned to another architect who died, um, and the mandate of designing Chandigarh came to Lako uh, So just a very, I mean, I think most of us don't need too much of an introduction into this, but this whole idea of inviting an internationally relevant architect to build an entire new city from scratch was very much part of what we today call an Ehruvian aesthetic of, of India, um, where again, much like uh, Kalakshetra and the theosoph Theosophical movement, uh, Nehru felt that, uh, that, you know, I mean, independence of India was a great thing, but it had also been accompanied by the partition of India. And the partition of India had been caused because simultaneously, um, while sentiments to unite a subcontinent had been raised. Um, religious identities and community identities had also been used to divide the country. So in many ways, um, his philosophy for design and aesthetics for a new country um, was, was based on his, was in many ways uh, embedded in this rejection of the past. And he wanted to embrace um, whether it was in terms of politics, uh, whether in terms of his foreign relation policies, whether it was in the commissioning of large scale infrastructure in the country, whether dams or 
uh, public supported infrastructure. Um, so Chandigarh fit in within that kind of a vision of an international city uh, made from scratch. It was not like any other capitals in the country which had actually evolved over several centuries and therefore had acquired a kind of aesthetic of their own like Delhi or Calcutta or Bombay or Madras which were the three presidencies. Um, of the British uh, Empire in India and then Delhi, of course, the capital from 19, from the early 20th century onwards. So this was very much a reflection of that kind of uh, a need to reject the past and to move ahead with a completely new identity for a country um, that would be aligned to international uh, sentiments and ideas of the time. Few examples, images of Chandigarh. This, this is the, the, the in, some of the interiors. Another thing very interesting happened, um, and and this was unique in Corbusier's trajectory also, was that both at um, we look at the Sarabhai Villa a little later, but not spend too much time on it. But because I come from a textile background, it's something that I find very sort of tempting not to point out that. Um, a lot of the interiors of, 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 of Corbusier's architecture um, uses textiles. So what you're seeing behind are actually tapestries. Uh, they're extraordinarily large tapestries in the Western tradition of tapestries. The tra the, just to give you a quick introduction, tapestries come from uh, a tradition in Europe where um, murals, for instance, which were painted on walls, were then replicated with yarn uh, because often uh, it was so cold that there was a requirement to kind of line them. So, so the tapestry tradition comes from a tradition of replicating murals and oil paintings, um, but also was functional because it was able to pad these interiors, you know, in, in environments which were very cold through the winter months. Uh, but India you know, funnily or perhaps not funnily if you think about it deeply, did not have a tapestry tradition of its own, even though whether it's block printing, hand painting, brocades, there is nothing in the country in terms of textiles that doesn't exist except for tapestries. So at that time, Corbusier designed himself uh, these tapestries, uh, smaller versions of which were actually made in Paris at a workshop. But a large number of them were actually made by traditional Dari weavers in Punjab. And what is interesting is that, um, you know, Kabusia was a person who has also been equally criticized uh, for actually uh, being quite unaccommodating with client requests, of so being inflexible about his, you know, I mean, for him, his project was really about, you know, taking an idea and placing it uh, and not often not in conversation with, with the aesthetic or visuality or the material culture of a space. But for the first time in his tapestries, we actually see elements from Hindu mythology and Hindu art and Indian art creep in. Um, and I'm bringing this, this is another image, both of them have been shot by a French photographer, Manuel Bugo, with whom I'm actually working on a book um, on tapestries of Chandigarh. So we have thousands of books on architecture and interiors of, of Chandigarh, but not on textiles. Um, so it's, it's a project dear to me, but um, perhaps that's why I'm dwelling a little more time. But what is interesting is here you see um, that he was, he was engaging with the country and he felt the need to kind of, to soften or warm up to the environment that he is. That he that he was he found himself in you know in the middle of nowhere literally uh, of Punjab um, you know he was building this capital and uh, a lot of whether it's in the use of color to soften the large scale uh, whether it's in the way the furniture was designed in collaboration with Pierre Jean Honoré his collaborator you find there's a kind of softening uh, of that and uh, we haven't I mean there's not much work being done on trying to understand how India may have influenced him but we, you see in the tapestries a reflection and I'm only bringing this up to kind of talk about how um, a lot of times we, t we, 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 we think and discuss India as having received this kind of modernism kind of blankly. Uh, but, 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 I, but I feel like um, for a country that is so kind of complex and visually rich, um, it's often perhaps not easy uh, to divorce it.
you know, and, 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 and you see an occurrence of that. So I'm not saying that Le Corbusier was inspired by India, but you see in this entire project, especially in the textiles, that there was a kind of uh, interest in, in engaging with the local context that you don't often find him engaging with um, in other projects of him internationally. And it's again an aspect of modernism that is not discussed too much because like I said earlier, you, we always receive modernism as a kind of import um, and never, never receive it as a stimulus. Um, what is also further interesting is that, you know, because obviously these large tapestries had to be made, there was a workshop set up. Um, and, and, and the traditional dari weavers of that region in Punjab are called Panja dari weavers. So they basically beat the, you know, when you weave on a loom, you have to beat um, the weft uh, part of, of, of a textile to put it in place. And that's called the Panja. It's a, it's a kind of five Panja, like, you know, in Punjabi we say for, for palm. Um, and um, a lot of these weavers then, or that entire tradition, uh, we haven't studied what it started doing later. You know, so, 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 you know, it's an interesting area for us to also study how the production of, of, you know, some of the greatest modernist tapestries actually in the world, which are lying now. And as you can see, um, you know, there are these AC ducts that have been introduced. So the tapestries have been cut to kind of place. Uh, so, so um, shows how, you know, how much respect we have for this kind of a modern heritage in a country that loves to claim, uh, you know, its place in to Corbusier. Um, but I think it's interesting to us to, us to start looking at modernism also as, as a mere stimulus uh, for generating responses and, and for an engagement um, beyond just, you know, um, uh, architecture. Um, I'm bringing this up because I mean, I went to the National Institute. I mean, maybe maybe it'd be interesting to talk about the, his uh, some of his other projects and then come to NID. But so this is the 50s, and he's also designed um, a, a private home um, in Ahmedabad for the Sarabhai family called Villa Sarabhai. Um, again. Um, uh, now there is research coming out because um, uh, there are letters that have been found between Maru Manurama Sarabhai who actually commissioned him to come to India and build the home um, of how much dialogue there actually was. So in, in this case, for instance, uh, the terrace was kind of on the recommendation of Mrs. Sarabhai, uh, made into a garden and that cut down the air conditioning cost substantially. So again, like the tapestries here, you see a kind of moment where um, Corbusier is kind of engaging with the local context, often that's not seen. The Shodhan Villa, another uh, family home that he built in Ahmedabad. The mill owner's building, uh, which, is, which, is a, which was an office for uh, the mill owner's association. To remember that Ahmedabad was the leading center for mechanized mill-made production right from the late 19th century onwards. And some of the biggest uh, mill-owning uh, families and, 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 and production centers were here. So it was the mill owner's association. And how that, within 10 years, actually had an impact on the architecture um, of the National Institute of Design. So now I'm talking about uh, uh, the National Institute of Design, an old photograph where you see actually a very old monument. Uh, and I find this image is quite interesting because um, at a time where homes must have looked quite different, what did, what is it, what did it mean for this completely kind of new aesthetic of minimalism to arrive on the banks of the river in Ahmedabad. Um, it's a very, I mean, that monument still exists. It's a heritage monument. And I find this image quite interesting because it kind of very easily tells us of what was that shift that took place aesthetically from an older culture of building and design and making uh, into this, com you know, into, into India's first design institution. Sorry design institution. A um, few other images of, 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 of NID, it was, um, of course, you can see the Corbusier influence, even though it was not designed by Corbusier. Um, it's still very controversial because nobody really has been able to pinpoint who designed it. But it's uh, obviously, um, it was obviously uh, conceived, the design and the spatial experience was, was uh, conceived by Gira and Gautam Sarabhai, who were the founders of NID. Um, and very active in, in kind of uh, setting its early tones. Another image of uh, 
of, um, of the National Institute of Design and you can again see how the interiors and our exteriors kind of are made to interact with each other. Um, it's the, another point along with Corbusier where we often talk about the beginnings of modernism because uh, here was, was a country that, um, that needed to literally produce everything that it needed because it was an economy completely devastated by colonial rule. Um, and it, NID was also set up as part of a Nehruvian vision. He had invited uh, legendary American designers Charles and Ray Ames to come to the country. They traveled for a year across the country and they suggested a mandate for a design institution, which then led to the setting up of the National Institute of Design. Um, this is the Sanskar Kendra, the fourth building that Corbusier designed, which is now the Kite Museum, um, in terrible condition, unfortunately. And uh, it's an early image, and therefore you can actually see the dry river bank. Um, uh, where where the where the dyed fabrics are actually being uh, being dried, um, the dyed fabrics are being dried, and uh, so all of this. So NID is actually just diagonally across from this, and suddenly you 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 picture this kind of you know blank space that uh, is filled by these iconic uh, pieces of international um, relevance uh, through Corbusier, um, and. Uh, Bringing us to another expression uh, of, of modernism, this was the early, late 1950s and early 60s. Um, we of course know that uh, Corbusier's legacy has been taken up by architects for several generations. This is the entrance to uh, the architecture college in Ahmedabad, um, designed by B.V. Doshi, who worked with Corbusier was his assistant on the India project, some of the India projects. Um, and we know today uh, that this kind of an aesthetic has become far more common, uh, accepted as part of, an, of a contemporary uh, vocabulary, uh, this use of brick and concrete, um, uh, it's kind of a play with scale, all of them kind of distinct, um, I mean, beginning from a kind of modern origin, but continuing well into the contemporary today uh, because this kind of an aesthetic is, is continues to be uh, kind of uh, regenerated and revised and, and engaged with by contemporary Indian architects as with international architects, of course. Uh, in terms of interiors, just a little, um, I mean, just as we move on to other sort of centers of modern expression, um, uh, you know, these are interiors of, uh, so this gentleman that I'm working with, the photographer for the tapestry project, also um, did photographed a lot of the interiors of Chandigarh, and in fact his interest primarily is interiors. Um, and it's, I think we can sort of see that um, the kind of interiors that kind of, um, um, you know, in the extended ecology of the big public institutions in Chandigarh, considering that Ch um, Kobusi also did planned the city and designed it. Uh, many of the residential complexes were also designed. Uh, we see again an, ev you know, an evocation of a kind of mid-century modern aesthetic that I think you know, all of us may be familiar with because at some point or the other we've seen this, these kinds of interiors all across the country in urban centers. So the, the impact was um, you know, unquestionably both on, on the design of the buildings as well as the kind of interior spaces that those kinds of buildings occupied. Um, now, not too many years just before Corbusier came to India and um, you know, these kind of highly publicized and discussed um, public projects, private and public projects of Corbusier kind of made headlines. Um, the Maharaja of Jodhpur had commissioned the Umed Bhavan Palace. Uh, this was uh, supposedly during a famine um, and the Maharaja of Jodhpur commissioned this palace um, and you can see therefore that within a span, within a decade, uh, you're actually seeing uh, the expression of two very distinct styles um, of architecture, the Indo-Saracenic, the, I mean, we can discuss this in detail, but you can see uh, sort of starkly the, the difference uh, between this kind of an aesthetic uh, and this kind of an aesthetic. It's still a palace, 
um, and it was basically, um, it has been recorded that it was commissioned, the building of the palace, um, to give employment to people who had been affected by the famine um, and uh, by the drought, by the drought which led to the famine. And um, what is interesting is that when uh, the, the palace was conceived in, in this kind of an exterior, its interiors were considered very differently. Um, and it brings us to another aspect of that modern story that often is not discussed because um, this was commissioned, the interiors were commissioned to a Polish uh, designer and architect called Stefan Noblin, who had made his way via Iraq uh, to India, uh, looking for commissions from Poland, fleeing Nazi Poland. Uh, so he arrives in India and becomes involved with um, a certain kind of elite you know, cultural environment in Bombay. He actually lived in Bombay. And it was through here that he was commissioned to actually work um, for his stay, through his stay in India, uh, on three projects, um, the first of which was Jodhpur. So we're looking at um, these ideas of, um, of art deco, uh, of a late kind of Bauhaus sentiment, uh, uh, the Berlin School, the Vienna School of Design, these kinds of expressions of modernism which are also um, sort of expressing themselves in interiors. These are drawings of Stefan Noblin. Noblin was an illustrator originally and we look at his graphics later but he was an illustrator and therefore he was you know, very good at, um, at illustrating um, the kind of interiors that he wanted for the Umid Bhavan Palace. Um, these are some of the other drawings. This is the bathroom, this is the dining, the private dining room. And I have often wondered, you know, what, what this family, the Maharaja of Jodhpur is kind of, what's going on in his head because ostensibly this is, these are these kind of, you know, um, very typical expressions of mid 20th, early to mid 20th century taste and, um, you know, and, um, and at the same time, there's this kind of ability to, to embrace in, in their interiors, uh, these kinds of minimalist aesthetics, which are of course very current for the time, but that you don't normally associate with Indian royalty aristocracy or the mercantile elite families. Um, another image, of course, um, of the bathroom. Um, by the time these projects are over, what is interesting is that the interiors look like this, which means that somewhere from the original intention of creating these starkly minimalist interiors, again, something has happened. Uh, so this is, what is interesting is that what you see is the throne room, and you would never associate an Indian palace to have this kind of a darbar because we know that darbars are all about chandeliers and pomp and glamour. Uh, so there's definitely a kind of rethinking of the role of royalty um, that's, kind of, that's kind of being enabled through these commissions and through the, the process of these discussions. Um, uh, but it's interesting because unlike, you know, a big throne, a big kind of um, you know, audience hall. This is a far more private chamber. Um, also, the illustrations that you see, the murals that you see on the walls, um, now of course considered among Noblin's greatest um, works, um, are a curious mix of 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 Eastern European aesthetics at that time, which are also figurative. Um, and they draw heavily from Indian mythology. So the murals that you actually see, um, a detail of it is very interesting, um, are placed within this kind of a movement which is trying to engage with, with you know, a late Art Deco sentiment in the country. And how that, that is, ref I mean, it's, it's very interesting for me because you don't associate this with modernism at all. Um, and uh, of course, because he's, he's from East Europe, um, he brings a certain kind of graphic quality or a culture or a tradition of illustration which is very much at that point current in Eastern Europe. Um, but some of the themes that are being depicted uh, draw from Indian mythology and Hindu mythology, but as you can make out are not 
expressed in any direct, identifiable Indian decorative way. So you have this kind of strange mix or an interesting mix, whichever way we look at it, of Eastern European modernism uh, intention to kind of um, introduce a kind of art deco minimalist minimalism, uh, uh, but expressing itself in this in this hybrid manner, uh, and this is also happening in the 1940s. So it helps us extend our understanding of what is going on during this period in the country and the many ways in which new aesthetics are being born, which are not just alluding to those ideas of minimalist modernism uh, that the West um, is kind of uh, sending across the world. Um, these are really interesting images. You can see that the sofa is starkly Art Deco in the Art Deco style of the period. Um, uh, of course, some of these images are taken much later uh, than it was, and we don't have that many images of how it originally looked like. But you can see what I'm tra talking about. From today's perspective, um, it's, it's, it's very decorative. It's very Baroque from that perspective. And yet it combines all of these elements, and it's all happening in India in Jodhpur. So again, you see the elements um, are starkly Art Deco. So you have the column, you have the bar, uh, you have the furniture. Um, but then you have these insertions. You have the Mughal carpet. And somewhere, there is that conversation going on. It's not only this and it's not only this. And that is what again and again I find quite interesting because these ideas were not, in my view, accepted unconditionally in the Indian context. I think they were engaged with. Um, there was a discomfort with them as well. And all of these kind of show, um, in my view, a certain kind of awkwardness to respond to the pure ideas of these kinds of, um, you know, of, of, of modernist designers that were coming in. Um, a view of the, of the swimming pool. And of course, um, because a lot of work has gone to um, preserve and restore these murals in the Umayyad Bhavan Palace, um, they still are around. But this is what the Umayyad Bhavan Palace, which is now a majority, uh, a major portion of it, uh, uh, other than the private uh, section, is a Taj property, one of its most um, celebrated properties. Um, this is what an interior today looks like, uh, where it has kept this intact, but all of this has changed. And it's, and it's interesting, therefore, to kind of try and think about how, uh, how is his aesthetic legacy received or the legacy of the larger project of the Umid Bhavan itself received today? Um, a bedroom. Sorry, I'm sorry. I have made a mistake. Um, this is actually now the second project, which I was going to come to later, is uh, the second palace that he commissions gets commissioned to do the interiors of is in Morvi in Gujarat uh, at the Morvi Palace. And uh, these two images, which I intended to keep in the next section, uh, actually have accidentally come here, are actually of a, of a bedroom in the Morvi Palace. Again, extraordinary murals uh, where you can see a kind of interesting aesthetics because later when we look at the Bengal school, for those of you who may be familiar, um, it reflects this kind of aesthetic of Indian miniature painting and the Ajanta murals and so on and so forth. Um, this is the bar in the Morvi Palace. Um, just to give you an example of, I um, mean, it's just a detail of, of, um, of his his mural. I mean, his graphic design because you can see that there's a kind of direct kind of reference or inspiration from how Indian women are represented in, in traditional art. Uh, but there's this kind of very uh, almost Greco-Roman representation of the man. So there's this constant negotiation going on, and I find that quite interesting. Um, just to give you an example of what graphic design in Poland of the time is, and then to make us to make a connection between um, the kind of figurative modernism that often is not talked about that was current in Eastern Europe at the time. Um, 
a detail of, of the Morvi Palace just to emphasize that these kinds of interiors also had you know what are very very statement making it's it's a very famous image by the photographer Raghu Beer Singh uh, I just brought it up because again it shows the way it is being used with Indian style carpets um, and since this is also around the 40s uh, it, it's interesting for me to kind of provide a kind um, a reference to a similar decorative tradition that was current at the time that has often also been called as an early modernist modernism in the country which is of the Bengal school in Shantini Ketan. So while all of this is going on, so we've discussed say a 1950s experiment of the Kanjivaram and the and the and the modernization of a dance form which reflects in in textiles. We've looked at Corbusier, we've looked at its relationship with um, you know its aesthetic relationship with the founding of an institution like the National Institute of Design. Um, we've looked at Noblin in Jodhpur, uh, we've looked at Noblin in Morvi and while all of this is going on um, you also have Shanti Niketan which emerges as a very Vishwa Bharti actually because Shanti Niketan was actually founded before um, um, before Tagore, Shanti Niketan was a was a kind of uh, was established as an ashram um, by um, before Tagore um, in this village, um, and it was Tagore who in the 20s then founds the Vishwa Bharti University there. Um, and what is Tagore's idea? I mean, a very international man. Uh, internationally acknowledged, celebrated, um, uh, Nobel laureate. Um, and while he traveled equally to the West and the East, his whole idea of trying to emerge a new identity for this country that's going through all of this political turmoil, ensuing nationalism, cultural reform. So the Brahmo Samaj movement was also actually born in this particular place, um, which, was a, which, was a, which was a movement among Hindu Bengalis of how to reform uh, Hinduism itself uh, as a religion, uh, quite structurally. Um, and it was within this kind of an atmosphere that you also see the rise of Shantini Ketan, which, where the architecture was quite interestingly very colonial. So you have all of these expressions which are trying to reject the colonial, British colonial aesthetics. So this is of course, um, uh, I mean, um, you know, this is a this is a kind of aesthetic which which brings in Indian elements to otherwise what we associate was Lutian's Delhi. It was the new capital of the British Empire in India, designed by Edward Lutian's, the architect. Um, and it's it's an aesthetic that's associated with Lutian's. So you also have this kind of you simultaneously you have this expression. Um, of in architecture um, of a different aesthetic which is not entirely rejecting um, uh, you know um, the colonial British influences while at the same time as a country it's, it's embracing other ways in which modernism are coming in through non-British or non-England cha um, uh, channels outside of England um, and uh, again a few images of the colonial architecture of the period And the kind of art that, I'm only going to briefly touch upon this, but the kind of art that actually comes out of Shanti Niketan and the Bengal school is actually going back to, to rural India. So you have these impulses of actually uh, embracing these modern ideas for an urban India. Uh, and simultaneously you have this this need to go back to India's past. And it's in many ways a kind of romanticism um, of India's past, Shanti Niketan itself is situated in a village. There's this uh, very close association with local communities. Um, there are, um, you know, most of the early Bengal school and Shanti Niketan artists are actually painting people whom they see in in the villages. Uh, so you have this simultaneous uh, expression um, uh, of of an aesthetic which is trying to go back. Um, uh, I mean, in its in its kind of content of going back to India's sort of rural villages, it's very Gandhian, and yet Gandhi and Tagore differed majorly, and therefore I can't say this is Gandhian. But there's a different way in which this this need to go back to India's rural rurality and and, and, and a kind of past is expressed, and it's very very romanticized. Um, 
it looks, it generates, you know, this is, this is Nandalal Bose, um, as you can see, depicting local Santhali women in Bengal uh, who live around Shanti Niketan. Um, uh, this is Abhinindranath Tagore, so simultaneously that kind of an aesthetic which is going back to um, to India's miniature painting tradition in art, but which is also throwing up new uh, visual, uh, new kind of visuality for the national movement. So you have, uh, you know, this very important image called Mother India, um, and this reimagination of India as this ascetic, um, faith-oriented, perhaps not you know, re overtly religious, but certainly alluding to that kind of a spirituality, faith-based identity. So you have this kind of an expression which, which expresses, um, which kind of combines um, miniature painting and the kind of legacy of that kind of skill, as you can see in, in the way it's executed, but at the same time is also presenting these completely new narratives of nationalism and patriotism. Uh, it's also in many ways again a very famous Abhinindranath Tagore painting, one of the Bengal school uh, artists, one of the prominent Bengal school artists of Shah Jahan. Uh, we perhaps all know the story of how Shah Jahan himself who had built the Taj Mahal was exiled by his son to the Red Fort in Agra. Um, kept in very poor condition, uh, but where he could see um, the Taj Mahal constantly. So this is also a time where along with nationalism, um, Indian art is trying to find themes which are non-colonial, which are non-Western referenced. What is interesting in all of this, uh, again on Nandalal Bose painting as you can see, um, while it's not um, in the miniature style, uh, it's certainly depicting a certain kind of rural aesthetic of the time. Nandalal Bose, much like Tagore, was uh, very inspired by the East and often what we don't talk about is this influence of Japan and the East on the setting up of Shantini Ketan and the Bengal schools. So at a time where um, you have this tremendous kind of engagement and relationship with what is happening with the Western world in Europe and North America, more Europe of course, not so much North, North America, but North America as well. You also have an expression of a new identity of art, architecture, uh, which is more concerned with, with the East and Japan. Um, just to something that I missed out earlier, a lot of the architecture, the colonial style architecture with Indian influences is attributed to Surendranath Kar, who was a Bengali architect working in Shantiniketan in the 20s and 30s. Um, and it was in this kind of a milieu, physical milieu, that art like this was actually being generated. Uh, what is also interesting is that I'm going to very briefly touch upon Bauhaus, which was a very major international design and art movement started in 1919 in Weimar. Um, and it was a post-war, post-First post World War phenomena where Germany was so devastated that it literally, much like India in 1947, had to find ways to make everything from scratch. So it needed to find in ways to industrially produce table, tables, crockery, almost everything that it required because all, there was devastation everywhere. And Bauhaus comes up and therefore in its, in its time as, as a new kind of international movement because its early tutors work from all over the world. It's in fact original logo had a Chinese yin and yang and a Hindu swastika and these are also histories of of the Bauhaus, which haven't been discussed much because from the 60s and 70s, it has been positioned as a very majorly or Eurocentric kind of phenomena. Um, Bauhaus artists and designers, which included very famous names like Paul Klee and Kandinsky, um, were shown in Calcutta. And it was an exhibition in 1922, which was held in Calcutta following a visit of Tagore to Vienna and to, and to Germany and he suggested upon hearing when he heard about Bauhaus in 1921 Bauhaus moved to a place called Dessau uh, it was then thriving became this international movement um, until Hitler comes and, and shuts it down and it's revived in post-war Germany uh, second world war Germany again but um, so interesting that you had the work of Paul 
uh, of Kandinsky, of Paul Klee, and all of these major modern artists known for minimalism and a certain kind of abstract style that was shown in 1922 with highly, within quotations, decorative art. And it was a show of modernism in Europe and modernism in India. So we are looking at a very self-conscious, self-conscious uh, or a, let's say an assertion of an Indian modernity in Indian art, which is being shown along with European art, which is highly decorative. And I don't think, I mean, I think we'll all agree that this kind of art today has, would be considered far more decorative and unmodern and traditional. But in 1922, at its own height, it is being shown in India with European abstract modernism and minimalism as modern art and that there was a space for us to recognize at that point that both these aesthetics, while starkly different, were expressing a certain kind of sentiment which may have been common, but that both modernisms could coexist even though their aesthetics were completely different. It's something I think we've lost in time in the present traditional modern contemporary kind of discourse. In all of this mix, uh, 10 years earlier, I want to talk about another experiment uh, which, is, which will bring me to the second last experiment of modernism that I'm talking about today, which was in Indore. Um, so the Indore state was, was ruled by uh, the Maratha family of the Holkars. Um, and this was one of their palaces in Indore uh, called Manik Bag. Manik meaning ruby and so a ruby jewel garden um, or something of that sort. Um, which today is now, which looks like this today, it's a contemporary image from, from recent years. And it's, um, it, it's now the income tax office. So the interiors of it actually look like this. Um, Originally, you see this room looked like this. Um, and for a, again, not as decorative, but for a traditional colonial kind of building like this, um, to have an interior like this was interesting. Um, it happened because the Maharaja of Indore at that point, Yashwantra Holkar, was a very international man. He went to Oxford. In Oxford, he met uh, a young architect called Eckhart Muthesius, uh, whose father was a very, very important um, architect uh, in the post Bauhaus, in the late Bauhaus in Berlin School of Design, uh, and himself became um, uh, an architect, an interior designer, and product designer, uh, known for a certain stark minimalist art deco and late Bauhaus aesthetic. Um, so these are early images of the of the Manik Bagh that I showed you. Um, early drawings of how there was a decision to actually move these roofs, which eventually wasn't done, but a render of what Eckhart Muthesius wanted this building to become. He was invited in the late 1920s and he's, he worked with the Maharaja of Indore, the Yashwantra Holkar, for 10 years on a series of commissions. Um, and let's remember this was more than 20 years before Corbusier came to India. So it's a different aspect of how, of dif different aspect of how this kind of European modernism was coming. So this is how the, the space looks like today. Um, this particular room in Indore, in Manik Bagh today, uh, which is in the income tax of Central Excise Office. Again, this room looked like this originally. Uh, so it was designed, uh, this is a Corbusier chair. Um, as you can see, these are pieces of furniture made by stainless steel. So, so it's kind of bringing in new materials that are not associated with Indian interiors and design at that time, like glass, um, you know, zinc, uh, polished wood, um, stainless steel into interiors. And this is all happening within a palace. Um, an even older picture of what 
it was originally conceived that that's a really famous chair it's called the Eileen Gray chair it was designed by um, a woman a designer Eileen Gray French designer who was rumored uh, to be Corbusier's girlfriend and there's a whole other theory of how Corbusier actually tried to suppress her because she was very very talented and perhaps even more talented than him but um, uh, a very very famous chair um, of Eileen Gray so this was a very interesting project to have happened in the country in 1930 when it did because at that time Indian Maharajas didn't live like this uh, to the extent there has been a lot of speculation if they were laughed at because you were not you were not as if you were a Maharaja you were not supposed to be living so austerely um, but how, however it happened uh, the bed which came up for auction a few years back, the Aileen Gray chair we got to know more about because about 10 years back it came up at auction in Sotheby's and suddenly everybody was like, oh my god, what is Manik Bagh and what was Eckhart Mathiasis doing in India and uh, oh my god, 1930s really. So another few images of, um, of interiors and in fact I feel and I'm doing some work on this. Um, I really feel that it's actually this aspect of modernism in interiors that actually India today has inherited and not, not so much Corbusier's. So it's, it's something that I think we may not have time to discuss because I can't spend so much time discussing it or showing you more images. But it's an interesting aspect because we, you know, the, the narrative of Corbusier has taken over so much that we've actually forgotten that Eckhart Muthesius was here and he was here for 10 years. What was also interesting was that the Maharaja um, allowed all of these pieces before they came to India because obviously they were commissioned and designed abroad to be shown in an exhibition in Berlin. So here was an entire palace and its cutlery and crockery on display in a public exhibition. Um, and it's interesting because I'm sh sorry, sorry, did someone say something? Because it's interesting because um, I think it also represents how Indian Maharajas who were struggling under colonial rule um, were trying to in much the same way that today, you know, when we travel abroad, we like to wear Western clothes and, and talk about how we have Muji in India and body shop. Uh, perhaps this was, you know, the Maharajas of the time's way of communicating to the world that, you know what, India is a British colony, but we have the means uh, to be able to participate in design and art conversations which are global. And the implications of actually showing all of this in Berlin, um, you know, um, as, a, as a way to message that these developments in the West are actually also making their way and they're aware um, uh, that Indians are aware of these kinds of developments. So again, um, um, you saw this, it was a detail of the same dinner table. Uh, this is one of the bedrooms, I think it's the Maharani's bedroom. The carpet that you see here is a very, very famous carpet. It was commissioned in Paris. Um, it was commissioned, it was designed by a, by a designer called uh, De Silva Bruns. He was a famous um, furnishing, textile furnishing designer. Uh, so this is, you can imagine the Maharani sitting like this, so she's, you know, you're just wondering where her entourage is, you think of Maharani's being, you know, surrounded by 20 people in their toilet and, and what this is doing to the mentality, just a deep mentality of India, Indian royalty at that point. Of course, it's a very rare occurrence uh, because you don't see this happening um, across all Indian Maharajas, but it's a very interesting one. Uh, some of you may have heard of Man Ray, a very famous surrealist photographer. So the Maharaja and his wife were very international and they were actually photographed by Man Ray. So the photographer is, I mean, the, 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 the couple is actually known among international, among the international fashion fraternity a lot because they were photographed by Man Ray. Um, Eckhart Muthesius also um, got involved in a series of other commissions. There were many other buildings to be made which eventually didn't get made, uh, like a summer palace. So there's a lake outside Indore where he had designed this complete Miami style retreat for the Maharaja and Maharani. This is the interior of um, a hunting van. So you have to remember that Maharajas were still hunting. It looked like this from the outside. 
uh, but it was completely mobile, it could be folded. Uh, so the commissions also included these kinds of um, the modernization, if I may use the word, of every aspect of the Maharaja's uh, you know, life. A very close image of, of the entrance, you know, like any other interior, I suppose, um, of a mansion today. Um, private, a small view of what the veranda looked like. All of this, you know, these awnings were foldable. So everything that was current in the West was actually being introduced. What is also what also what is also what this interior is also very famous for, and what um, Eckhart Mathieu's association with the Maharaja of Indore is also famous for was uh, bringing in works of a very famous sculptor. Some of you may know of him called Brancusi. So these sculptures actually are iconic, and of course they are no longer in the country. But he also developed a very personal relationship um, with Brancusi. Um, you see the kind of paintings that are on the wall. You see the kind of furniture that the space is occupying. Other details of the library. And some details, so for instance, because Eckhard Mathiosis was interested in, in, in these. I mean, this, this whole movement, the late Bauhaus and Art Deco movement at some point was also about how product design was an end in itself and it was a work of art. So these are actually light fixtures uh, using mirrors, which were also like almost had sculptural qualities. So a very interesting set of developments, which, um, which actually to go back through all the images show very little sign of an Indian engagement. So earlier I had talked about whether it was Corbusier or Noblin, there was this kind of an Indian response that was, that was visible. This could be anywhere in the world. And what is interesting is therefore that a person of his caliber is given the complete, I mean, what you call complete freedom to design an interior on his own terms. And this could be an interior anywhere in the world that you don't see. So another way in which these ideas were expressed, where you also see that kind of um, complete need, perhaps, without that Indian intervention or the local intervention. Which then brings me to um, unrelated, but uh, since so much of what we are talking about is really um, in the realm of what we see in terms of modernism's direct physical influence of Indian, of, on, on Indian aesthetics, of Indian interiors. We know very little about um, the people who made all of this possible and what was going on in their mind. And therefore, I wanted to end with uh, another aspect of modernism, which is much later because it is in 1960s, but where we, where we get a very interesting glimpse of um, how the whole process of coming to India and, 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 and kind of developing a new contemporary praxis um, also transformed the person and this happened through someone called George Nakashima um, who was American Japanese um, and he was invited by the mother of the Aurobindo ashram. Uh, the Aurobindo Ashram, again, um, you know, a, a spiritual group um, um, and the mother who conceived a French lady who came to India and along with Sri Aurobindo, who was also a national, uh, nationalist leader, um, in fact, in his early life had, had completely opposed views from Gandhi because he believed in, in, in means of violence to overthrow British rule and things like that. But as some of us or all of us may be familiar that he founded a very, uh, very popular um, and influential um, spiritual movement of the Sri Aurobindo Ashram in India. And um, the mother who was his, his companion and, and partner in, in, in many of these projects um, conceived of Auroville in, in Tamil Nadu as an international city. Um, originally, which would not perhaps even require passports to come in, uh, with very, very international life. So this is around the same time that 
that NID is kind of gathering momentum and seeing its early years. And George Nakashima is invited to Oroville in Tamil Nadu to um, actually design the furniture for Oroville. Uh, just to give you a quick background for those of you who may not be familiar with George Nakashima's work, these kinds of chairs today have come up um, in international auctions and George Nakashima is a very, very big name. Um, and there is a kind of use of, of materials which is, which is very, which shows a, a kind of, um, I don't know how to put it, but there's a kind of, um, I mean, all of, considering that all of this was also coming at that point within, within precincts of international modernism, there's a softness to it. There's an emphasis on the handmade. There's an organic quality to the, to the product, which um, I won't say is opposed to the kind of aesthetics that we've seen, whether in Eckhard Muthiesi's work or Corbusier's work, but is certainly distinct and is definitely at the same time considered part of, of expressions of modernism as well. So it's another way in which these ideas were being expressed. Just some other examples of his furniture. Um, often interpreted as a very, very interesting blend of, 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 Jap of you know, Eastern Japanese aesthetics and Western modernism at that time. Um, some of his furniture, um, I mean, many modernist, very stark Western modernist, modernist proponents may not think of something like this, which is so organic, which is so free-flowing as part of that kind of modernism. But it does emerge during that time. Uh, another work, another work, a bench. And this is what he was also, this is what he finally designed uh, among many other pieces of furniture in Oroville, a very famous table. So this is actually, I don't know if any of you have been to Oroville and to the ashram, but this is in an area, have you seen this table? It's, uh, it's in a section which is considered the, the most private uh, called Gulkond. Um, and this was um, called the peace table. So he was commissioned to actually, in a, in a space, um, design a table, which would be the center of Oroville. Uh, called the Peace Table, it was conceived as, um, as the central point where people would gather uh, to talk, to meditate, to discuss. Um, and he comes to India, um, to Oroville and is later then invited to NID and produces his largest body of work of his drawings, technical drawings in NID. So in fact, NID still reserves all the copyrights to those drawings and can still reproduce Nakashima's furniture. I mean, chairs like these today are going up in auctions for like 10,000 uh, pounds per chair. So, so it's, it's a very, very interesting archive in Ahmedabad today at the NID because he's then invited to NID where he produces a lot of his work. And you see again, much like Shanti Niketan, uh, even though the aesthetic may be quite different, you see this kind of coming together of East India and the West. Um, and why I wanted to end with this was also because, so this is what the, what the, what, what the tape, where the table is placed today looks like. This is the gold cone. Um, this is how it is used, so it's literally where people gather. Um, and why I find this very interesting is because while, you know, when I began with the Theosophical Movement, we're talking about, um, I'm talking, trying to talk about the impulses for a lot of these things not coming from any kind of um, physical need, as it were, but they're coming from what we may term as more spiritual or aesthetic, uh, in the case of Theosophical Movement, also very faith-based movement, and again, Auroville. And what actually happens is that um, between, the, between his travel to Ahmedabad at the NID and Auroville, where he's designing a lot of furniture, um, he actually becomes an ashramite, and he takes on an ashram name. So from George Nakashima, he becomes Anand Priya. Um, and it's again a very interesting aspect of, um, of modernism that comes to India from the West um, that contains um, 
the ability to embrace another culture to such an extent that it causes a very fundamental change in a person's life itself you know um so yeah i'm going to end with this because i thought it was a nice way to kind of look at what happens to the people since we don't know what really was going what happened to ekhat mutusias whether he was inspired by india whether he liked to eat samosas or have bindi ki sabzi we don't know all of these things um and it's an area that i'm very interested in that when we talk about the coming of these kinds of models of of modernism from the west imported modern mod, uh, models how they transformed in the indian subcontinent due to multiple reasons for its own specific reasons for its own for its own um kind of ability to create a synthesis of cultures um and in the case of george nakashima actually leads to a very fundamental transformation of a person's life that he actually becomes an orbindo ashramite thank you take some questions if there are questions or I said it's often considered an import but it became a stimulus so instead of just accepting it as, as it were often it became a way to enable other kinds of conversations and thoughts am i clear change now i would i think we'd agree that often modern people are called modern because they are more westernized so sorry i didn't get your question yeah, yeah. it's uh, that yeah and that's what i'm trying to kind of revise or not revise but trying to rethink for myself that you know considering uh, we've been discussing so much about what is contemporary what is traditional and then you put in the definition of modernism with all its loaded connotations um which in the mid 20th century are about architect ideas of architecture and so on and so forth but today could be about women wearing jeans so you're a modern woman because you're wearing jeans um say in a village in india you know so um how much of how much of the appropriation of modernism has actually been taken over by the western discourse and um, about its synonymity with a european and north american context uh and through these i don't know if it help but for myself through these examples i'm trying to kind of uncover um and trying to understand that and discover that actually it was not as monolithic you know that it was far more nuanced and it was far there was a far more greater synthesis synthesis that took place um leading to completely new forms you know and that we need to look at um these as also expressions of modernism uh in the same way that we might look at expressions of modernism through corbusier or these you know iconic pieces of minimalist um geometrical abstract forms of architecture so i'm just trying to expand that conversation through this and give a few examples of of us being able to develop that conversation into a more kind of nuanced conversation about what modernism can mean you know please yeah the tapestries that you told me about the prayer uh, he covers it is the he had some influence of uh, indian art in his uh, designs of the tapestries and the people who actually made it were the local artisans so what impact did this design this he uh, covers new design which they may have never seen uh, in their in their lives they, are, they were practicing something else so after this project of this uh, work what effect did it have in their uh, future uh, like other works their regular works you know it's a very good question uh, which i'm trying to answer because nobody has studied this because obviously if you have hundreds of weavers who are producing 
over three, four years, these crazy tapestries, uh, it should have had some impact, right? So, but what we see from that region after the 50s when these were made, um, in the 80s you see um, the same area and the same Punjabi weavers becoming involved with cotton, contemporary cotton dari. So, like brands like not not Fab India but Shamahuja, you know. So Shamahuja makes the same region and the Punjabi weavers the center for his revival of cotton dharis. But that's also very interesting because, and therefore it's a very good question because um, traditionally these kinds of dharis that you know today we take for granted with geometrical shapes that we use in all our homes that are cotton and wool or jute, um, a lot of their designs were associated with India already, you know. So what is interesting to understand is whether Corbusier was exposed to these dharis, which also would have these kinds of symbols, or whether this was a complete... So it's unfortunately, I can't answer your question because we don't know. We've not understood and we've not defined, we've not kind of, un not defined, but we've not understood what happened after that. See, in furniture we know because what happened immediately was that this extraordinary production center that was set up in Chandigarh to make all of this furniture for the capital complex impacted interiors in India until the 70s. So the kind of furniture that you see uh, in Chandigarh um, continued to be made in the country till the 70s from you know Tamil Nadu to Delhi. You know, I mean, in De I'm familiar with Delhi, but uh, you know, there's a, there's a whole street next to Connaught Place called Panchkunya Road, where you could get Art Deco furniture. So how did Art Deco furniture become so commonplace that, you know, our grandfathers also had them, our great-grandfathers also had them. So its impact in furniture you can see directly, because that production center obviously then started sending its surplus or leftovers to Delhi. Through Delhi it was circulating. You have to also remember that um, this kind of, I mean, until the 70s, the fashionable way of building homes, you know, outside of those who had access to modernist architects, you know, to design their homes, was Art Deco. It was a very, very important, you know, I mean, you go to Karnal in Haryana, you go to, uh, you know, any part of the country today that Art Deco influence was there right till the 70s, you know. Um, so the furniture had a very important impact because through that production center, it was then sent disseminated all across the country. In Dari's we don't really know. So what I'm trying to say is that we don't know whether that kind of aesthetic was picked up because India had a traditional culture and tradition of what we call jail Dari's. So these kinds of Dari's were actually woven in jails and it was a tradition started during Akbar's time. Simple stripes and geometrical patterns on Dari's um, with little triangles and things like that. They're also associated with Islamic prayer rugs, right? The, the Islamic prayer rugs. So we don't know whether some of this was actually being uh, transformed um, because of what he saw in India or whether this impacted our ecology and therefore led to much later in three decades. So I mean, in, in, exactly. So I mean, a lot of the iconography is very tantric. You know, the snake and the sun and, you know, these kinds of things. It's very abstract, but you find it in Tantricism in India. You find it in, you know, in Buddhist art, you f certainly, you know. So we don't know. And I mean, in the show that um, Pooja was talking about that I last curated at the Jawahar Kala Kendra in Jaipur, um, I've done this. So I've, I've placed one of the photographs of Corbusier's tapestry with the Shah Mahujadari. Because within a span of 30 years, these are considering that Shah Mahuja was um, India's first major textile international brand um, and Corbusier was India's biggest sort of import. Um, so I've placed these two without really forcing a connection but trying to say in 30 years this same region is producing these two expressions of a very identifiable contemporary form, you know. But its impact would have, would have been definitely there, you know. Much upon textiles and this, um, yeah, I didn't. It was. I mean, my beginning was textile, but uh, having worked so much in textiles, I wanted to kind of also because the thing is also that I'm not looking at. Um, 
I'm trying to see these as larger aesthetic expressions rather than how they were expressed in individual pieces or elements. So I think for me as the first time kind of suggesting this idea of how we need to look at all of this. I mean, you would not think Corbusier had anything to do with, with the Kalakshetra Sari, right? But they all, both of them come from a certain kind of Nehruvian idea of a liberal, as controversial that, as that word may be, of a liberal new identity for a post-independent India, you know? So, yeah. So, so the sorry that you showed orange, yellow, and check. You know, I recently went to Auroville and I saw Mathur Mandir. It reminded me so much of those colors and yeah. architecture. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the thing is also so that... Also minimalism. Yeah. I mean, yeah, people are now saying that how much of Western modernism didn't take from the East because these kinds of, you know, this use of blue, red, yellow, it's found in cultures all across the world, in Asia and Africa and Japan, and so didn't Western modernism also kind of take those ideas of color from the East? I mean, these are things that are being debated and introduced now uh, more confidently than before. Yeah. You tell me. I mean, all of us live in homes, all of us drive in roads. Can you tell something? When you were showing these images of uh, these uh, palaces, very gaudily decorated, mixture of uh, European and Indian, and. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so it reminded me a lot about today's Bombay homes, you know, where, like, you know, yeah, where you go and you see this uh, kind of, you know, ceilings and lighting and furniture kind of uh Yeah, I mean something I mean yeah. I mean something like this could today, um for the lack of a better I don't know whether I have a better word or phrase for it, but it may be received today as an expression of a, of a new wealthy mm -hmm. of a nouveau rich, you know? So, I mean, considering that this was being expressed, you know, this kind of hybrid aesthetic, which often those of us who are trained in, in a certain kind of resolution of design, uh, you know, reject because we think, oh, it's too hybrid, it's too mixed. Uh, but this was what was happening in, in the palaces of India's Maharajas, who themselves were dealing with these multiple identities of how to position themselves abroad, how to position themselves, you know, to their own community of royal, of uh, other, uh, princely families of how to, uh, you know, I mean, these Maharani's were wearing tennis shoes and saris and playing tennis, um, you know, while they had to go, I mean, while women were in Parda, you know. So it's, in many ways, it's, I find this moment very interesting because the multiple identities that an elite, an English speaking elite in India um, was negotiating seems to be quite similar to the kind of multiple identities. So I don't want to use the word confused, but it's certainly hybrid, where you don't see a resolution. Whereas if you see something like this, you certainly see um, whether it's here, here, or whether you see in, in, in Eckhart Muthesis, there's a resolution. You know, there's a, there's a arrival of a certain kind of of a form that then, you know, can be identifiable. But in, in some of those expressions, it's kind of back and forth in my view, you know. So how it relates to today's, I think all of these aesthetics exist today. And, you know, you have, you have all of these ex aesthetics which ex coexist and, uh, and uh, yeah, as they did at that time. Is there any pure form which is like dominant? I don't think you can say that. I mean, if any of you work in architecture or interiors, you may be able to throw light on this. But I mean, as, as someone who looks at all of this from the outside, no longer a practitioner, I feel that India certainly, like, I mean, you'll have the stark white minimalist interiors, and then you'll have, I mean, one thing that puzzles me so much, quite, quite frankly, is the return of the Victorian aesthetic. You know, this highly embellished decorative aesthetic considering that even though India and the Calcutta of the late 19th century and early 20th century was heavily inspired by the Victorian aesthetic, um, 
it was the worst period in Europe itself. So, a hundred years later, where Indians have far more exposure to world history, to taste, to uh, I mean, to varieties of taste, to you know, formats of retail, uh, you know, this. I mean, in fashion, it's exemplified with the uh, say designers through designers like Sabi Sachi, where you know, there's this crazy uh, return of of the Victorian Indian aesthetic, you know, uh, and it puzzles me because. It was a worse period in, in Europe, you know, in Britain itself. Um, so today when we know that, you know, we know far more about the world, uh, what is it about, you know, this phenomenon of women wearing gowns um, in their weddings rather than saris and, you know, dressing up. I mean, uh, sorry to catch this on camera, but, you know, I mean, there were photographs circulating of India's richest family. Uh, and recently when one of their sort of next generation got engaged, the photo private photographs that were circulating on WhatsApp had white women playing the harp and all women were wearing pastel chiffon gowns with tiaras, you know. Um, and these are, you know, this, I mean, this is, I mean, you would think India's wealthiest family has access to certainly an Armani gown. Uh, but, but tiaras and white women playing harps and, you know, it was like a, it was like a, a fairy tale, you know. Um, but increasingly I see bridal is becoming like that, you know. You have these fantastical images and fashion shows with women walking around with wands and, you know, so it's, it's, I mean, I don't understand where those references are coming from, you know, but clearly it's, very democratic and there are all of these things which coexist, you know, so... Who do you consider modernism and modern as such? Because everything would be in the present, right? If something is modern today, it's not going to be modern tomorrow. Or what was modern hundred years ago, it's not going to be modern today, right? Perhaps, yeah. I mean, my question is that, my question is that, uh, I mean it's given, right? So in architecture there is a, there is a historical, modern, contemporary, these are the ways in which they're defined as they are in, in art and design. Uh, usually modern is associated with late 19th century to mid 20th century and then contemporary in more recent years. Um, I'm, I'm more interested in, Instead of trying to define it for myself, I think I'm more interested in discovering how plural expressions of it existed and that we don't have to look at just one definition. And I think all of these can coexist. I mean, if a Bengal school that uses miniature painting from the 16th century as a technique to express, you know, mythology is shown along with the Paul Kandi with the Paul Klee work in Calcutta, and both are considered modern. Modern, um, when they have aesthetically nothing in common, I think for me that's interesting because it helps us kind of understand um, also the politics of definition. So you know that and why it's required. You know, I mean, I was discussing with 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 our class that. So much of this is, I mean, you know today something is modern because it comes up at an auction twice a year. So you have an auction house or auction houses that will tell you this is modern furniture from the 20th century and this is contemporary furniture from the 1980s. So, so much of this is also dictated by or informed or controlled by the way it's sold, right? Um, which would be very different from a catalogue of an auction for antiquities, which would be very different from a catalogue of an auction for decorative arts. So, so much of I think these definitions become really important because there's somebody out there who needs to sell. Uh, and to, to sell, they need to tell a story and therefore this cannot be modernist, but it has to be contemporary and this can certainly not be antiquities and this can, you know, only be design and it can only be a certain kind of design and you know, within design it can only be product design and so on and so forth. So I think um, I'm trying to just 
um, at this point trying to question where these definitions come from. Uh, and one when, once we can identify that these definitions have become coded or identifiable in, in limiting or rigid ways, to try and open them up, you know, for further definition or redefinition.